I'd like to welcome you all here this evening. My name is Bob Roth. I am the Vice President of the David, David Lynch Foundation. And tonight we launch Operation Warrior Wellness New York City, a collaboration, as you'll hear, between the wonderful Donna Karen's Urban Zen, I think the most outstanding community outreach in New York City or in any city, and the David Lynch, David Lynch's David Lynch Foundation. My name is Jerry Yellen. I'm one of 16 million people who served in World War II. On my 18th birthday, February 15th, 1942, I enlisted in the Army Air Corps. I wanted to fly fighters against the Japanese because of what they did at Pearl Harbor. I graduated from flying school with 10 hours in a P-40 in August of 1943. 28 of us in our class were sent to Hawaii to get further training, and I remained in the 78th Fighter Squadron my entire career in the military. We flew P-40s, then P-47s, and then we flew P-51s. And on March 7, 1945, we flew from Saipan 650 miles to a small eight-square-mile island called Iwo Jima. There were 90,000 soldiers fighting on eight square miles of land. 67,000 American Marines and 23,000 Japanese defenders. The sights, the sounds, the smells of that battle remain with me to this day. There were 28,000 dead bodies strewn across Iwo Jima, 21,000 Japanese and 7,000 American Marines. I had a mission. My mission was to kill Japanese. I flew 19 eight-hour long-range missions over Japan. The first was on April 7, 1945, the first land-based mission ever flown by Army Air Corps fighter planes over Japan. I watched as bombers dropped their bombs, B-29s dropped their bombs on square miles of Tokyo, which was burning, and not once did I ever think there were people on the ground. They were Japs. They were not human. They were my enemy. On August 14th, the war ended. I had flown with 16 young guys who didn't come back from the war. The oldest was 26, and the youngest was a guy from Brooklyn by the name of Phil Schlomberg, 19 years old. When I came home, I had a very difficult time. Speaking to my parents was impossible. Speaking to my sister, Maxine, was difficult. It was tough to talk with anybody. I had no buddies. I had no airplane. I had no mission to fly. I really had little purpose in my life. In 1949, on Good Friday, I went on a blind date with a young lady from Brooklyn, Helene Schulman. We were engaged on May 30th, married on October 22nd, 1949. Our first son was born on November 6th, 1950. Our fourth son was born August 16th, 1960. And without Helene, without her support, without her knowing anything about what I did or why I behaved as I did, she loved me and I loved her. And then, in 1975, she saw Maharishi Mahesh Yogi on television and decided she wanted to learn how to do transcendental meditation. And she learned, and I learned shortly after, and my life changed dramatically. I felt comfortable with myself. I felt better about myself. I felt better about other people. I became a better person. Last year, early in the year, I received a telephone call from a young woman that I knew 
by the name of Lynn Clock. And she asked me, Jerry, do you know how to dress a uniform? What do you mean, Lynn? Well, you know, put medals and ribbons in the proper place. I said, why? And she said, Dory committed suicide. I knew Dory. He was a Bosnia veteran, been in the military for eight years, and came home and killed himself. When I dressed the uniform and she left, I freaked out with myself. I was terribly disturbed. I knew what combat was like. I knew what it did to families. I knew what Bob Roth was doing, a good friend of mine with the David Lynch Foundation. So I called Bob and I asked him, do you think David would like to open up a division of the David Lynch Foundation called Operation Warrior Wellness? And that's the way this began. It's why you and I are here tonight. Today, there are 50, 500,000, 600,000 young veterans coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan suffering from what I suffered, undiagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder. Linda Bilmes, a professor at Harvard, and Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel laureate, wrote a book that was published in 2008 called The $3 Trillion War. They estimate that it cost $15 billion a year to take care of the mental health of the veterans coming back from those two wars. Antidepressants don't work. Antipsychotic drugs don't work. We have a better solution called Transcendental Meditation. And we ask you to think about what that does for our veterans and their families. Every one of those 550,000 who are suffering from post-traumatic stress have 10 other people that are affected. Their families are affected. Everybody is affected. And we ask for your help. We ask, as an American, for your help. We ask you to help your veterans and their families. And Operation Warrior Wellness is certainly available to help, too. Thank you very much. Well, that's a very hard speech to follow and quite an inspiration for why we're all here today. I'm Donna Karen, and I want to welcome you to Urban Zen. Urban Zen was my husband's studio, Stephen Weiss. He was my, hus uh, my partner in business and my partner in life. Ten years ago, this Thursday, we'll have passed away from lung cancer. And on his journey for seven years, I basically, uh, I've been a yogi since I've been 18 years old, so that was just a few years ago. But uh, <laughs> practicing yogi and having all the tools that I needed to be able to find the calm and the chaos in the world of fashion, I asked my, and saw what my husband needed. And it was very clear that at that point, there was something missing in the medical system today. We very rarely know how to treat disease, but how do we treat the person? And as each and every one of us is a person, and each and every one of us is a loved one, dealing with the trauma that we deal with today, what are the tools that we all need? What are the tools that can take us through from moment to moment the crisis that we're about to face? Urban Zen was established on those principles. What we wanted to do was to connect the dots to create, collaborate, and communicate the change of mind, body, and, sp of mind, body, and spirit that is the missing link in education and in healthcare, while preserving the wisdom of the cultures of the East and Western principles, particularly that of meditation and of yoga. We truly believe here that those are the tools that are so desperately needed in each one of our facilities today, and that is to all people all over the world in every education facility, that meditation is definitely the key to opening our hearts, minds, and bodies, and spirits, and being able to develop the type of people that we're looking to have around us today. 
So I sit here today and it's such an honor to know that like-minded people want to come together to create the change. It is not about me, but it is truly about we. It is about each and every one of us collaborating, communicating, and creating that change. And it is an amazing honor to have David Lynch to be here tonight in the Urban Zen Center to announce the collaboration of Operation Warrior Wellness. Because there's no other project possible that I could imagine to open our hearts and our spirits and our loves for each and every one of the people who are dealing with post-traumatic stress. So it truly is an honor to have you all today and to really become aware of what the miracle of what meditation and the awareness of what our mind and body can allow us to be and to be those people and to be that person for the other person that is sitting next to us to give them the wisdom and the ability to find the calm in the chaos. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to my partner in crime now, David Lynch. Thank you, David. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very, very much for being here tonight. And I want to add my thanks to Donna Karen and Urban Zen for partnering with the David Lynch Foundation to bring awareness and support for this great, great cause, Operation Warrior Wellness, and bring an end to the suffering of our soldiers who are really going through uh, a kind of hell that uh, none of us on the outside know about. Uh, so this um, is, is such an important um, thing. And Jerry, thank you so much for, for starting this, Jerry Yellen. Big hand to you, Jerry. I think you're going to hear some very good news tonight about how we can end this suffering with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And thank you again. Hey. Good evening. My name is uh, Captain Eric Tausch with the U.S. Marines. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for the Marine Corps here in New York. I've been in the Marine Corps for about 23 years now, um, seen service in Iraq, uh, as well as uh, witnessed devastation uh, during uh, a number of humanitarian assistance operations, uh, tsunami relief in Sri Lanka, uh, earthquake relief in Indonesia, and mudslide relief in, uh, in the Philippines. Um, I hope you'll forgive me tonight as I use a couple of notes. Uh, the, uh, the story I want to tell you tonight isn't my own, um, so forgive me as I reference uh, back and forth. Um, wait, did you guys all just miss all of that? <laughs> really? Raise your hand in the back if you heard any of that. All right, we're good. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> and, uh, in 2009, uh, President Obama said, uh, freedom isn't free, but the U.S. Marine Corps will pay most of your share. Um, the word in that phrase that, mo that a lot of people don't pay attention to is the word most. It's most of your share will be paid. Uh, it is a tremendous honor tonight uh, to be in your company and the company of such a great organization who has uh, really realized that most means there's some debt left over that needs to, needs to be paid and uh, witnessing an organiza organization uh, that is willing to take that step to reach out to pay that small portion that hasn't been paid yet is, is very incredible. So thank you so much. Um, you know, my father is a Vietnam veteran. He was a, uh, a helicopter pilot who miraculously walked away from uh, way too many uh, smoking uh, crashed landings where his aircraft looked more like Swiss cheese than an aircraft. Um, Unfortunately, he saw many who were not so lucky to walk away. Uh, many of those were seated in the cockpit right next to him. Uh, returning to an unwelcoming and unempathetic nation at the time, uh, he carried those ghosts for more than 30 years. Uh, the unrelenting images took him through two marriages, uh, took away most of the time uh, watching his kids grow up, and uh, peace of mind for three decades. Uh, you know, and it, uh, it really was because of what we now recognize as post-traumatic stress disorder. Fortunately, he found hope uh, over the past 10 years 
primarily in the arms of a, a wonderful woman, his third wife. Um, yeah, some laughs there, right? Uh, in the, and really in the throes of a nation that, is, that has now uh, come to embrace uh, the warrior, regardless of what they think of the war, which has been tremendous. Uh, and that is echoed, echoed uh, to our veterans of the past. Um, and finally, through meditation. Uh, I spoke to him last night and told him uh, I'd be visiting with you all today, so thank you for coming. Um, he had, a, had three things he wanted me to share with you. Uh, number one was uh, meditation is not voodoo. Uh, it's about inward reflection. The human mind is incredible, but we're incessantly barraged by thoughts, by input, by cell phones. Um, my dad said that meditation doesn't stop the barrage, but it's a tool for lessening the impact of those thoughts, giving his subconscious, uh, subconscious mind the time and the space it needs to reveal the answers he seeks to his conscious mind. Uh, number two, meditation is one of the best tools available for overcoming PTSD. Simply put, he said it relieves the recall. He said he's still anxious in large crowds, but even that is getting better. Third, to make a real difference in relieving combat-related post-traumatic stress, it takes someone who understands both PTSD and meditation. When, he, when I spoke to him last night, he said nobody can possibly understand unless they've been where you and I have, son. Operation, Operation Warrior Wellness is doing a tremendous job of marrying these two for a recipe that is sure to satisfy the appetite of today's warfighters who hunger for normalcy once more. Thank you for your efforts on behalf of all Marines and on behalf of my dad, who said last year that he was finally able to watch the film We Were Soldiers Once and Young. Thanks to a loving family, a grateful nation, and daily meditation. Thanks. December 18th, 1967, Newsweek. Yeah, five days after my birthday. This is a, a story called The Day's Work. And this is my unit. We went out and got ambushed. And this is me. You know, doing, doing my job. We were attacked at this place called Buddha. That fight went on for two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. The first night, I killed 14 people. There were 2,500 of them and 250 of us. The next morning, in front of my fighting position, 18 of our men did. So this is very, very, very distressing, and it creates huge amounts of distress in, you know, in, your, in your system, in your system. And then um, later in the magazine, coincidentally, is this. This is an article about Marishi Maishogi and a couple guys in my, in my platoon. One of, one of them got the magazine, and he came running over. He said, Parks, you got to read this. So I did, and I said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Because it talks about stress release, about, about becoming a whole person. So then the next part of the story is getting home. And that's a whole big deal, because things changed. Things changed. All of a sudden, you're in a different culture. All, all these people don't understand you. They have no idea. They don't realize that that you're always, always still in the rubber plantation of the jungle. You're always on adrenaline high. You're looking to protect your buddies. You're looking to protect yourself. You're looking to kill the enemy. <laughs> I, I stopped talking to my parents. I had really bad relationships with other people. I did not feel happiness. I did not feel sorrow. I did not feel surprise. My feelings were gone. So one day, um, my wife comes home, says, hey, I saw a poster about Transcendental Meditation. And I remembered, I remembered that article in that magazine about Maharishi, and then I said I was going to do this. And so I go in, and he's, you know, he says, okay, sit down, do this. And I could not believe what happened. 
It was the difference between heaven and hell. It was absolutely transformational. All that feeling of, of stress and all that feeling of heaviness, I could feel it melt away from my head to my feet. And from that moment on, things changed. <laughs> things changed. No more drugs, no more alcohol. Life changed. My emotions came back. My life came back. Forty years later. <laughs> Mike, is it working? Oh, I'll trip. This is my wife, Cindy. Cindy. And our son, Celine. Warriors get wounded in war. And when a wound is left untreated or partially treated, suffering occurs and the wound festers. Make no doubt about it. PTSD is a wound. It causes individual and social suffering. And when it is left untreated or partially treated, it festers. Cindy and I and our family are PTSD survivors. And, and actually, we're not survivors. We didn't just cope and survive. We've thrived. And it, everything is due to our regular practice of meditation. And we talk about families. We talk, the military talks about collateral damage. What is the collateral damage of PTSD? It's the families. It's the families. And our family has really survived. It has survived. The other thing about a wound is, you know, it, it hurts. I was wounded by shrapnel, and it hurt. But that did not hold a candle. It was totally insignificant to the wound I had from PTSD. And we survived because of meditation. Now, the David Lynch Foundation is offering the treatment, the cutting-edge treatment of meditation to treat PSD for our suffering warriors. It is time that we fund PSD, PT, not fund PTSD, but fund meditation for the, to add to the treatments that are already being offered for PTSD. It is time, not later, but now. It is time that we stop the festering of the wound of PTSD, not later, not now. And I'm reminded of a famous aspirin commercial, not commercial, research study, where the researchers found that the results of taking an aspirin were so dramatic on the prevention of heart failure that they stopped the study in mid-course. They felt it was inhumane not to offer meditation to the control group who was getting a placebo. Oh, aspirin, forgot that. <laughs> Thank you, wife. <laughs> they thought it was inhumane not to offer aspirin to uh, the control group and to prescribe it to the general public. The research on meditation is dramatic. And from our point of view, it is inhumane not to fund and offer meditation to our warriors and their family. Now, with your help, we can get this done. With your help, we can start tomorrow to accomplish this mission. Let's start tomorrow. Thank you.
Good evening. What a pleasure to be here in this beautiful space. Thanks to Donna and everybody. My name is Dr. Norman Rosenthal. I'm a psychiatrist and a researcher. And for 20 years, I was at the National Institute of Mental Health, where I was involved in describing seasonal affective disorder and developing light therapy as a treatment for it. And I can tell you that light therapy was regarded as pretty wacky when we first did it, and it's now mainstream. In the last 10 years, I've been working um, with major pharmaceutical companies, running my own organization, doing trials in anxiety, depression, and other conditions. Now, you've heard the stories of Jerry Yellen and Dan Burks, and they're pretty amazing stories at that. But there really is more out there than individual stories. There was a wonderful controlled study done on TM in Vietnam, post-traumatic stress disorder victims, and the study showed that TM was superior to the psychotherapy of the day. And just recently, we conducted in our organization a study on five veterans of our new wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And the study was funded, incidentally, by the Dalio Family Foundation and was published only last week in Military Medicine, which is a peer-reviewed journal. And speaking of peer-reviewed journals, you may be interested to know that there are now over 340 studies of TM and its benefits in health, mental, and physical that are out there in the literature. Uh, in the study, what we found at the most basic level, which is surprising in itself, is that these veterans did not have a hard time meditating. They meditated easily, comfortably, and effortlessly. But more than that, within a couple of months, their symptoms of PTSD had been reduced by 50%. And I could tell you some of their amazing stories, but you have heard already some amazing stories, and you will hear more. And you can read about two of them in my book that you will all receive before the end of the evening. Now, to some extent, we could have anticipated that TM would be helpful to PTSD, because a meta-analysis of 146 studies showed a major impact of TM on anxiety in general, and PTSD is, after all, one of the anxiety disorders. Now, like Donna, I want to connect the dots here this evening and try to help understand how can such a simple technique this process, which you sit down 20 minutes twice a day, comfortably and effortlessly, thinking your mantra, how can this simple, innocent, subtle technique have such an impact on this major illness or condition? Part of the clue lies in the stress response system, the fight or flight system. Normally, the stress response should be like a short story with a beginning, a middle, and an end, focused around a specific stress. But in PTSD, the stress response is always on. It's there, grinding away day and night. During the day, people can be hypervigilant, easily startled, subject to very painful flashbacks. One veteran I know, every time he went over a pothole, he had the feeling he was right back there uh, running over an IED in Iraq. Their nights are disrupted by awful nightmares. They can wake up drenched in sweat as though they're back in the battlefield again. And TM is known to be able to settle down this flight or fright, flight, fright, fight response <laughs> that occurs um, in, in uh, when people are overactivated. As you saw in the earlier videos, there can also be a numb detachment until this kicks in in full force. So we know now, as we've heard, and as many of you know, that PTSD is a huge problem. It affects one in seven of our deployed um, Marines and soldiers from our recent wars. 
costs an enormous untold amount, and yet the VA is overwhelmed and doesn't have the resources to deal with it. So it's really time for us to think about new and alternative approaches, and I would say it's time for us to fund some large-scale controlled studies of transcendental meditation. Now I'd like to show you just a few slides from a different condition, which will illuminate, I believe, how TM might be able to really help us uh, with PTSD. If you look at this first slide, it's a meta-analysis of the effects of TM on blood pressure. And look how TM lowers blood pressure, superior to all the other stress management techniques. Here you have biofeedback. Here you have muscle relaxation. Here you have this combination that actually makes the blood pressure worse. So when somebody says, I'm going to get a stress management course, it's really important which one you choose. It makes a big difference. Here are two arteries. The one on the left is nice and open and clean with its linings clean. This one is affected by the very common illness of atherosclerosis, whereby cholesterol and inflammatory cells infiltrate the lining of the artery. Now, whatever organ is at the other side of this artery, you're in good shape there, but you're in trouble there. If it's the heart, you're going to be susceptible to a heart attack. If it's the brain, you're going to be susceptible to a stroke. One in three people in the United States and all developed countries die of cardiovascular illness. What happens to people who meditate? In this brilliant study uh, by Robert Schneider and colleagues, you see that those who were randomized to the meditation condition in the blood pressure studies versus a health education control have a 25% lower mortality rate after an average of eight years. And this is all the more remarkable because nobody even knows if these people continue to meditate. These were just people who were in a study seven or eight years before, and they went back and checked their death records. 25% reduced mortality. And in a follow-up prospective study, this is health education, death, heart attack, and stroke, and this is transcendental meditation. It reduces the risk of these things by 47%. So what you see is that through the day, year after year, this technique is settling down this fight-or-flight system. It has an amazing effect on the body. It prolongs life. And I would venture to say that's what it's going to do for PTSD. Year after year, day after day, it's going to settle these people down and help curtail their disabling symptoms. Thank you. I don't know a lot about PTSD. Uh, I do know about LSD. <laughs> and um, I, I knew a lot about uh, cocaine and, and um, heroin, little heroin, and angel does. Uh, yeah. Mike? Mike? LSD? <laughs> I'm sorry, can you hear me? So I, I have a history. I mean, the reason I think that um, all, of, all of us are looking for, all of us are looking for moments of stillness so we can see um, so we can just watch our thoughts from a distance. And, and for me, you know, my name was Rush. I, my nickname, Rush, was my name. And I used to think that the anxiety drove me. And the anxiety and, and, and the noise and the outside world pulling me or pushing me to, to um, make decisions or to, to be motivated or to, to succeed. And then it was nothing further from the truth. It was not the cloudiness from the noise or the drugs, but the clarity from the stillness and the meditation that changed my life dramatically. And so I've been meditating for many years, and, and I really couldn't believe how instantly it affected me. To be able to watch your thoughts, the noise comes and the noise goes. 
And so what, what he's talking about, the inflammatory thoughts or the anti-inflammatory thoughts, are what we're, we're all trying to balance and let the inflammatory thoughts or the noise on the outside settle so that the strength from the inside can come out. It is impossible to operate, even to have a second of happiness without a second of stillness to match. Every joke you accept, every creative thought you have, every transformative action you take comes from the stillness from within. This is not something that, that um, is new with, that came with the Maharishi. He had a great rap. He said, when the mind was still, the world surrenders. And it sounded great in the Beatles and everybody bought into it, but it's, and I know we don't like to say religion because it's scary, you know, some people feel uncomfortable with this stillness, and it's why we, in schools, refer to it as quiet time. But it's, it's interesting that with the science matches with every prophet and all of the religious teachers. They all look for stillness, from the idea of Christ consciousness to nirvana, to samadhi with the yogis, to taqwa with the Muslims. All these enlightened beings, or all these people who are inspired people, if, if not enlightened, all knew that from stillness everything arises. And so this, this meditative practice, this twice a day, when a noise can settle and you can watch your thoughts, it allows you the freedom to make choices that are not pushed or, or pulled by the noise on the outside. Inside of us, all of the happiness and the strength that we need to survive is sitting. So long as we are surrounded by and, and, and taken over by what's on the outside, we are separated from that strength. So for me, although I don't have any experience, I had lots of experience with noise and anxiety. I know that uh, the anxiety, they say, and many nutritionists are proving and doctors are proving that all of our sicknesses, our cancers, our, our um, the diseases that set in, set in because of the nervous system. And the practice of stilling the nervous system twice a day, it, you carry it through the day. You actually carry it through the day. It's not the 20 minutes, it's the 24 hours that, that are affected so dramatically. And the research, as the doctor told you, and it, uh, you see all the gray matter just growing in the brain. You see there's so much research and so much uh, um, so many students in schools, so many of the worst schools have become the, some of the best schools in this country. And so giving this to the soldiers as they come home is, a, in my mind, is not only a no-brainer, it's a, it's a, we owe it to them. Uh, I've been working with uh, the, the foundation on the advisory board and trying to put meditation in schools for some time, and, and I see the transformation in the students and the learning, and, and the, 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 they don't need any more medication. They just need meditation. So many kids are being stuffed with pills and they're not getting better. And then so many other students, we have such great proof. Some schools in the middle of the hood where there was the worst violence and, and, and the kids who are diagnosed with ADD who become such great learners and so nonviolent as a result of their practice. It's just obvious. You know, I, sometimes, you, you know, I've been talking to the First Lady, said, yeah, we love that. You know, I think if the President said meditation, it, it'd probably throw him out of the White House. Um, it's, it's sad that so many people know and so few, and, you know, we have these uh, um, impediments. It's not a religious practice. It's just stillness. It's just quiet time. And to me, we owe every soldier who fought for us that quiet time. And so I'm here to help to, if I can uh, convince someone to, to support this effort with, with their funds or to, to uh, volunteer and help the teachers who do, then I, then I want to be one of the voices. So I have a great experience, not only with myself, I've written books on the subject, and so many people have thanked me for, for those books and for how it has affected and changed their lives. So I'm just one more voice. I have... Concrete proof, my name is Rush, do I seem... <laughs> I, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't take any drugs. I just, clarity. You know, you, you take those drugs because you want the noise to stop. You put a cigarette in the, the smoke, it cloudies your mind. 
So maybe the thoughts, you have less thoughts because there's hundreds of thoughts running through your head and if you're high enough, you won't have any thoughts. But the opposite of that and the same kind of happy high comes from clarity and one that's stable and lasting and, 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 and allows you to kind of wisdom that just put inside you and given to you. So it really is a very special practice and it, as much as I can uh, do to help Bob and, and David Lynch Foundation, I'm always willing to do and you guys being here makes a big difference. Thank you, Donna, for having me. And thank all of you for being supportive of this program. Thank you. Russell Simmons has been instrumental, really instrumental in the David Lynch Foundation providing scholarships for over 150,000 children to learn to meditate in the last few years. From the profound experiences to the scientific research which documents the changes in heart health and anxiety and depression, we return now to another experience. Mothers every day in the United States and really mothers every day all over the world watch their children go off to war. And often when they return home, their sons and daughters are different, distant, lost, angry, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. This is exactly what Julia George faced when her son David came home from Iraq. My name is uh, Julia Elena George. I am the mother of David Maurice George. When he finished high school, uh, he decided to go to the army for one major reason. I will never forget that. He was very, very upset and heartbroken when the Twin Towers collapsed. He says, I'm going to go. The war started while I was in basic, so when I got out of basic, they gave us this speech that, you know, you kind of hear in the movies where it's like, look to your left, look to your right. These guys are not gonna be alive. We spoke many times over the phone while he was in Iraq, and he was telling me what he was going through. The big thing for me was a car bomb had hit our compound and gotten through the gate, and Luckily, one of the guards shot the car till, till they detonated, till the people inside detonated. There were two uh, enemy combatants, I would say. Uh, hit the trigger right, I guess, as they were dying, and uh, blew the car up, and subsequently, f like 50 people were injured in the attack. It's so horrible, this explosions and killing and seeing his friends, arms here, heads there, right in front of you, your good friends. Oh, when he come back, yeah. that's the part that sometimes I don't like to talk because it's so painful. He was out of his mind for the effects of the war. He was disrespectful. He was not, he was cursing me. I just gravitated towards alcohol. I bought, I bought a whiskey, I bought Jack Daniels. And that's how that started because as soon as I had a couple of swigs, I was like, all right, well, that takes care of that. And so... Every time afterwards, when it would creep up, you go drink. And not obeying the law, not obeying nothing, absolutely nothing. He had car, many car accidents because he was drinking. He said, I don't care, mom, I don't care. If I die tomorrow and I crash a car. And he told me, one of my friends just died. Don't you understand you? I was, I am supposed to be there. If I would be there, he will not be dead. And I'm here. What can I do? Tell me. What can I do being here? So I was afraid many times he will kill himself. Many. Many. That one day when I come from work or when I go downstairs or when I wake up in the morning, he will be dead. I lived like that for so many years. When he found the DM, he changed his way of thinking. He started appreciating his life. And he's another person.
he's, he's, he's normal. He's thinking about the future, thinking about respecting more than anything, respecting himself, loving himself. The first class that he went to, he says, every day, every time that I meditate is better, and I feel better and better and better. Thank to the TM meditation. He's not drinking, he is happy. It's beautiful, it's incredible. The first time I meditated, I experienced this, this relief from the constant anxiety attack my life had become. I didn't even realize I was that stressed out, but after my first 20 minutes, when I came out of it, I, I realized, I was like, that was, that was a break. Now being someone who's meditated for a year and, and two months, I'm so happy. I, I'll never stop. You know, it has this, this compounding effect of just getting better and better. And this great feeling lasts for longer and longer. The more I meditate, you know, why stop? That is the boy that I raised. TM saves his life. That's the first time I saw that video, and my mom totally blew my spot. I thought I was being slick, but all right, what do you want to say? Oh, my goodness. I cry. I'm still crying. I thought I would never cry again, but I did. I want to thank you. I want to thank the organization that brought me here with my son. We are an example to other, other soldados other soldiers que han regresado that have returned guerra, from the war y que and that eres el perfecto ejemplo para que, and I'm a good example of para que ellos decidan hacer for those that can decide lo que has hecho tú. you know, y what sean, I did go along that path y sean como tú. and be good so and for the moms too, the moms. I, it's always hard to follow everything of what people have said before because I don't want to say the same thing. And one thing that everyone has in common is that suffering aspect. You might not know what PTSD is or how much it really sucks. So it's like, you know, I don't get it, whatever. But you do know what it is to live in that cloud and that was, what, a year and two months, I said, of meditating? And then when I hear myself say that, I'm like, I was like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> but this is two years and two months now, and I'm great, right? <laughs> so. And uh, they told me I only had about two minutes, and I guess that two minutes is up. But I want to say that it works meditating twice a day. I've been doing it for two years, two months, and like three weeks, and like two days, and I'm gonna do it. <laughs> and I'm gonna do it for the rest of my life. And the support, you know, that I had, I was really lucky. My mom, I did it, because my mom took care of me when I couldn't, you know, physically, you know? <laughs> and, and what TM did was take care of me like mentally so I could look at myself and get myself out of that cloud, out of that suck, the suffering. So everybody, if you're not doing it yet, start doing TM, I'm telling you. Uh, thank you. I want to make one point before I introduce our next speaker. It's not meditation, it's not TM. It's, it's who we are. It's who we are. Meditation is a way to get rid of the stress, to wake up the brain. So we are who we are. All these things are just who we are when we're not shrouded and buried under stress. One of the foremost researchers in the world on the effects of meditation, specifically transcendental meditation on the brain, 
is Dr. Fred Travis, who heads up the Center for Brain Consciousness and Cognition. And I'd like to ask Fred to come and speak for just a few minutes so you can see exactly what's happening in the brain when a person meditates. And then after that, we're going to present Resilient Warrior Awards. And then I'm going to have a chat with David Lynch. And then that will be our evening. So please welcome Dr. Fred Travis. Thank you. First slide, please. So I'm going to be talking about brain functioning, uh, traumatic experiences, and transcendental meditation practice. How this works is the brain's the interface between inner and outer. And what happens is every experience we have changes the brain. Your brain's a river and not a rock. As a river cuts a channel in a hill as it flows down, so every experience you have, the experiences you're having tonight, are leaving a mark in your brain functioning. If the experiences are growth-promoting, holistic, and then they're positive. If they're traumatic, and then they're dysfunctional. What PSD, PDSD is, is a result of a traumatic experience in the brain. What we see here is the amygdala. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> oh my goodness, here we go. So this is the amygdala. What's interesting in men, the right amygdala is more active with PTSD, which has to do with context. With women, it's the left amygdala, which has to do with details. And what the amygdala is, is the source of the PTSD symptoms. It's your fear center. It's constantly on, and so you're hypervigilant. You know something bad is about to happen. You can't trust your friends. You can't trust your family. You can't trust yourself, because this is what your brain is telling you. The amygdala also turns on the fight or flight response, as Dr. Rosenthal mentioned. What this does, it turns off your frontal integrative circuits, which allow you to think. At the same time, it turns off memory, so you begin to have memory problems. So trauma experiences have created the brain structure for PTSD. So to get rid of PTSD, to turn off the amygdala, you need an experience which is the opposite, the opposite of trauma. So rather than chaos, you need silence. Rather than fragmentation, you need wholeness. Rather than uncertainty, you need complete certainty of who you are and where you're going. Meditation experiences give inner experiences, but all meditations are not the same. So we need to thoughtfully choose which meditation. We have here three categories of meditations. Um, it's been determined by procedures, by brain functioning, by cognitive control. The first two, focused attention, open monitoring, keep your mind involved in thinking and doing. You're actually involved in that same process of PTSD. You're involved in that same hypervigilance. You're involved in that same wonderment. The third category, automatic self-transcending, includes meditations which transcend the steps of thinking. It allows the mind to go to your inner essence, feel the pure consciousness. Now, this is what's happening in your brain during transcendental meditation, which is in this category of automatic self-transcending. Here we have increased activity in the front of the brain. This is magnetic resonance imaging. The front of the brain, which is the boss of the brain, it puts things together, it integrates things, begins to function while the subcortical areas, which are in charge of hypervigilance, become more quiet. So what is happening is transcending during TM is resetting the brain. And then what happens is the brain is no longer giving you those signals that things are bad, that things are wrong. This experience of transcending helps to lead to silence. It takes you beyond thinking. And transcending thinking allows you to transcend PTSD. Bottom line, trauma turns on the fear centers. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> this is different than the one I usually use. Trauma turns on the fear centers. It turns off the thinking centers. Transcending leads to restful alertness. It restores balanced functioning of mind and body. It allows PTSD symptoms to disappear. It allows you to be happy and successful in life. Thank you for your attention.
our scientists speak so short. Thank you very much, Dr. Travis. I'd like to ask <clears throat> I'd like to ask Jerry and Ed to please come up and also Donna and David. This part for all of us, the Urban Zen and David Lynch Foundation is a high point because we're going to present the Resilient Warrior Award. And the ancient The ancient meditation texts exhort the warrior to courageously perform his or her duties, but to do, so, to do so by drawing from the unbounded energy, power, and clarity that lies within his own true self. Quote, established in being, perform action, the meditation texts proclaim. Then the warrior will be healthy, absolutely wide awake, peaceful inside yet powerful, dynamic, resilient. This is the resilient warrior, and this is the honor we bestow this evening on our two founding co-chairs of Operation Warrior Wellness. As you heard, Jerry Yellen is a courageous World War II fighter pilot who led 19 missions over Japan and harbored no love for his enemy, but who has since raised a beautiful family and dedicated his life to bringing peace and understanding between peoples and who has written several powerful books on war and peace, including the amazingly compelling Resilient Warrior, Healing the Hidden Wounds of War. You'll all get a copy of that. Jerry is crisscrossing the country on behalf of Operation Warrior Wellness to raise the funds to bring relief from PTSD to every veteran, every soldier, and every cadet who wants to learn to meditate. My friend Ed Schloman is a brave Marine who fought in Vietnam, returned home to America to raise a lovely family, and run several successful businesses. But Ed has an amazingly huge heart, and he never forgot the disabled veteran. He dedicated his life to ensuring the economic, physical, and spiritual well-being of all veterans. And now with his dear friend, Jerry, he is dedicated promoting health and tr transformation for those who serve in the military past, present, and future. I'd also like to ask Ed and Jerry's family members to please stand up. They're here. Could you please stand up? Having, having thanked the families, please join me in honoring Jerry and Ed for their service to America and their service to those who protect Americans. Thank you, everybody. Please be seated. How are we doing? Do we have a story to tell? Well, my wife Judy says, if you live long enough, you will experience everything in life. And again, this is some experience, I'd say, for Jerry and me. <clears throat> As you see, this award is big, literally big. <laughs> However, our challenge is big. As I look out here, I see America. I see 99% of us sitting here and across the country protected or being protected by that 1% who are giving their lives for us, our military. And we're here tonight to protect that 1% who are giving their lives for us as we speak today. That's hard to believe, but less than 1% of our country is protecting the other 99%. The David Lynch Foundation, in partnership with Urban Zen, wants to be able to train 10,000 veterans this year who are suffering from post-traumatic stress. The number is small compared to the number who is suffering, but it is a start, 
and it's starting today. Transcendental meditation is a cure. It's a warrior's cure. Again, our challenge is big, but Operation Warrior Wellness is bigger. On behalf of Jerry and myself, and all meditating warriors, and those who will soon be able to learn, thank you for this honor, Semper Fi. Thank you. Those of you who perform acts of kindness without expectation of reward will receive the greatest reward of all, immortality. So give to this foundation, please. Thank you. David, um, I wanted to um, offer my you know, support and encouragement and these efforts to help children and veterans, anyone who needs the help to overcome stress through meditation. Um, of course, a lot of drama is projected onto the screens of our consciousness, our minds, day and night, the patterns that you learn from childhood, intrigues, resentments, hatreds and terrors. And the most difficult ones, the most wrenching anxieties can be triggered by anything at all. They come upon us and grab a hold of us. And we identify them as real because they're so immediate. And I guess the common response is to tough it out. In other words, to suffer. Now, I've been a firm believer in suffering all my life. Um, my pictures are kind of volatile, and they certainly can attest to that. And yet, recently, I, I learned that you may not have to suffer to make them as much. Um, may not be the way it's supposed to be. I think of children. Children are particularly susceptible to like absorbing the anxieties, their anxieties. They look at the adult world, they see a, you know, a scary place, big. They read, uh, they try to read the looks and the gestures of the adults. They try to master it all, you know, whether it's homework, mathematics, or the entanglements, uh, the emotional entanglements between the parents. And for veterans who've endured the trauma of war, I can only imagine the potential barriers, I mean, the fears and the suffering. So for the last few years, I've been practicing meditation, trying, and it's, uh, it's difficult to describe the effect it's had on my life. I can only mention maybe a few words, calm, clarity, a balance, and um, at times a recognition. And it's made a difference. Six, six years ago, David started the David Lynch Foundation for Consciousness-Based Education and World Peace, and he had only one deep desire, to ensure that any child anywhere in the world who wanted to meditate could do so. And in those six years, actually it started before he started his foundation, it's more like seven or eight, David has traveled around the world, speaking on college campuses, big public forums, he's written a book, Catching the Big Fish, he's finished a film called Meditation, Creativity and Peace, which is about to come out, a documentary of his 16 country tour. He's done countless interviews just to realize that one goal, which is such, as this, is such a human right, silence, quiet, peace. It's there within us. It doesn't have to be fabricated. We're not, it's like an ocean. The surface of the ocean is waves. Silent of, depth of the ocean is silent. Surface of the mind, active, dynamic, all the things we got to do. How do we find peace on the surface? We don't. We just access that level deep within ev each one of us. It's there. Doesn't matter the religion, philosophy, belief, non-belief, it's there. We access silence and life is transformed. Would you please join me in welcome an incredibly great human being and a very dear friend, David Lynch.
Thank you all very much. <laughs> Bobby is, you know, sometimes... <laughs> Be nice. <laughs> I'm an Bobby okay, is always I'm an okay truthful. human being. He's a great man. <laughs> My question for you is, what is your reaction to what you've heard tonight? Well, I think my reaction is probably your all's reaction. Um, there's a big problem, uh, lots and lots of stress, and, and it's called traumatic stress. And it's such a bad stress, most of us don't know what that is, how horrible it is. It's, it's, um, I, I've heard um, that a, a large number of soldiers commit suicide because they just want to get out of the body and get out of that pain. And we all hear that uh, these speeches of the politicians where they say they, wanna honor the, they want to honor the, the returning soldiers, um, but we kind of get the feeling from hearing other things that um, the soldiers are not getting when they return, they're not getting what they deserve. They're not being treated like uh, the politicians say they should be treated. And we all feel this. And this post-traumatic stress disorder, the things they come up with to treat it, um, so many of these things just mask the problem. So when you hear like they go drinking or they take drugs, legal or illegal, it's just masking this thing. Transcendental meditation take you easily and effortlessly to the deepest level of life. You transcend, as I said recently, it's like having a hammer, knocking the bolt off the top of a boiler of poisonous stress, and it just comes out. Get this to the soldiers, get this to the students who are suffering, get it to the people who are suffering, get it to the people who think they're happy enough. And uh, this world will, will really, really change for the good. And you heard you know, them say, life gets better and better and better. And we're supposed to be happy human beings. We're not supposed to suffer. We're not supposed to suffer. One more time, we're not supposed to suffer. I'm going to switch gears and ask a question that many people say, well, Dave, if we're not supposed to suffer, your films? <laughs> Got a comment on that, Dave? I am the exception to the rule. <laughs> no, 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 I always say, I, th I discovered this, um, you don't have to suffer to show suffering. And that is, a, no, it's a blessing. It's a real blessing. You don't have to die to shoot a death scene. You don't have to suffer to show suffering. If you fall in love with an idea, you get all fired up. It's just like falling in love with a girl that maybe you might not want to take home to meet your parents. <laughs> but you're in love. So what can you do? You fall in love. Uh, with an idea and you do it and you do it with such happiness so much happiness comes from within when you transcend every day so many more ideas flow freely heavy weight of negativity lifts away you enjoy your work enjoy it so much and you enjoy getting all the little parts to work so well together it's so beautiful and and people don't have to go see my films some some people honestly enjoy them so <laughs> Uh, it is, but you don't have to suffer to show suffering. You don't have to make films when you get happy that are just all happiness. There would be a boring thing. I say, make a film about doilies. <laughs> um, it, it's not going to happen. How, how, did, how did you... F <laughs> all through history, people have told stories. And stories have highs and lows, suffering, beautiful things happening, just like life. And so it's, it's important, uh, it's, it's beautiful to be able to tell these stories with the many, many horrible things, many, many beautiful things swimming together, but you yourself don't have to suffer, just enjoy the doing. Last question. We were just uh, last week in San Francisco for a, a meeting with the David Lynch Foundation with the San Francisco schools. There are now 
2,000 students in four public schools in San Francisco who begin and, eat, and end each day with quiet time, with 10 or 15 minutes of meditation, and 350 educators. And the research that's come out from the San Francisco Unified School District, funded by the David Lynch Foundation. And the research that has, yeah, that's great. It's worth clapping on that one. <laughs> And the research that has come out shows a dramatic reduction in uh, suspensions, a dramatic increase in grades and academic performance, dropout rates go down, dramatic transformations. And um, David was there, and I wanted to ask your reflections on that and also what the superintendent said. Um, the, um, if you are a human being and can think this technique will work, and it is so beautiful to see students that a few years ago went to a school that was known as the fight school, fights in between classes all day long, a fight at least once a week that brought the police and an ambulance, murders, stabbings, suicides, all the hell you hear about. Our schools, generally speaking, are hell and a pathetic joke. And the kids are suffering, and it's baloney. It is it's worse than that. It's a very stinky bullshit. And it... You give this technique to the students, and you'll see a miracle. It'll look like a miracle, but it makes perfect sense. They're transcending, they're infusing happiness, love, energy, peace, creativity and intelligence. Their grades go up, their relationships improve between the, them and the stu other students, between the, the, all the students and the teacher. The fights stop. It becomes a school you would want to go to. It is so beautiful and it's just adding this one thing, transcending, experiencing that big ocean within all of us. That's the only difference. And the superintendent of the Unified San Francisco School District stood up in front of a group as big as this and said, it's not funny anymore. It's, it's, it's very serious. Listen carefully. This thing works. He had never seen a change in, the, in his time in, in, in the history of his time in schools of a thing that did as much as this. And support this. You've heard what happens to the warriors. They, uh, it, it transforms their lives. The suffering ends. And I'd like to say one more thing. I have put some money into this foundation, but I'm looking down here and I see a greatest supporter of the David Lynch Foundation is in the front row. He's a great human being and his name is Please give him, give him a great big round of applause. His wife, I'm sorry. Stand up, please. Please stand up. How did you really feel about TM and education? <laughs> it's so great you're here, and, and um, I hope that you will um, support Operation Warrior Wellness and uh, all the programs uh, you've heard about, and um, get this technique for yourself to dive within, transcend, and see your life even how, if it's great now, watch it just get better and better and better. Thank you all very, very much. Hey, hey. Thank you, Bobby. So we conclude tonight. First, I have to say, on behalf of everyone of the David Lynch Foundation, huge wave of appreciation to Donna Karen. Huge wave of appreciation to Donna Karen. And her absolutely superb team, the David Lynch Foundation, myself and others have come and taught much of the Urban Zen staff to meditate. And when I walked in and sat in a meeting on the first introduction to talk about it, 
my heart just melted. I mean, everybody on your superb team, Donna, led by you, such warm hearts, such caring individuals, a blessing for New York City and the world. Thank you very, very much. And Janet Keller. And Jessica Stewart and Aaron and Rachel and everybody with the David Lynch Foundation. And we're now, we're now going to conclude with a vision of a new generation all over the world meditating. We have a two-minute clip of pictures of David Lynch Foundation programs funded all over the world. And when that's over, we'll just sit for a few minutes in silence or meditation. And so I should say again, and also thank you to Eric for coming and speaking, and all of the speakers, everybody and all of you for coming. Such a fulfilling evening of not just hope, but substance. So thank you, and if we could watch this video, and then we'll have two minutes or three minutes of silence. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming, and in your goodie bag will be a card for more information, and if you want to learn to meditate, you're also going to receive Dr. Norman Rosenthal's best-selling book, Transcendence, Healing and Transformation Through Meditation, and Jerry Yellen's book on the Resilient Warrior, and all sorts of other wonderful things. Thank you all very, very much for coming. I sit here today and it's such an honor to know that like-minded people want to come together to create the change. It is not about me, but it is truly about we. It is about each and every one of us collaborating, communicating, and creating that change. And it is an amazing honor to have David Lynch to be here tonight in the Urban Zen Center to announce the collaboration of Operation Warrior Wellness because there's no other project possible that I could imagine to open our hearts and our spirits and our loves for each and every one of the people who are dealing with post-traumatic stress. So it truly is an honor to have you all today and to really become aware of what the miracle of what meditation and the awareness of what our mind and body can allow us to be and to be those people and to be that person for the other person that is sitting next to us to give them the wisdom and the ability to find the calm in the chaos. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to my partner in crime now, David Lynch. Thank you, David.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very, very much for being here tonight. And I want to add my thanks to Donna Karen and Urban Zen for partnering with the David Lynch Foundation to bring awareness and support for this great, great cause, Operation Warrior Wellness, and bring an end to the suffering of our soldiers who are really going through uh, a kind of hell that uh, none of us on the outside know about. Uh, so this um, is, is such an important um, thing. And Jerry, thank you so much for, for starting this, Jerry Yellen. Big hand to you, Jerry. I think you're going to hear some very good news tonight about how we can end this suffering with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I'd like to welcome you all here this evening. My name is Bob Roth. I am the Vice President of the David, David Lynch Foundation. And tonight we launch Operation Warrior Wellness New York City. A collaboration, as you'll hear, between the wonderful Donna Karen's Urban Zen, I think the most outstanding community outreach in New York City or in any city, and the David Lynch David Lynch's David Lynch Foundation. My name is Jerry Yellen. I'm one of 16 million people who served in World War II. On my 18th birthday, February 15th, 1942, I enlisted in the Army Air Corps. I wanted to fly fighters against the Japanese because of what they did at Pearl Harbor. I graduated from flying school with 10 hours in a P-40 in August of 1943. 28 of us in our class were sent to Hawaii to get further training, and I remained in the 78th Fighter Squadron my entire career in the military. We flew P-40s, then P-47s, and then we flew P-51s. And on March 7, 1945, we flew from Saipan 650 miles to a small eight-square-mile island called Iwo Jima. There were 90,000 soldiers fighting on eight square miles of land, 67,000 American Marines and 23,000 Japanese defenders. The sights, the sounds, the smells of that battle remain with me to this day, there were 28,000 dead bodies strewn across Iwo Jima, 21,000 Japanese and 7,000 American Marines. Thank you very much. Well, that's a very hard speech to follow and quite an inspiration for why we're all here today. I'm Donna Karen, and I want to welcome you to Urban Zen. Urban Zen was my husband's studio, Stephen Weiss. He was my, husband, uh, my partner in business and my partner in life. Ten years ago, this Thursday, will have passed away from lung cancer. And on his journey for seven years, I basically, uh, I've been a yogi since I've been 18 years old, so that was just a few years ago. But uh, <laughs> practicing yogi and having all the tools that I needed to be able to find the calm and the chaos in the world of fashion, I asked my, and saw what my husband needed. And it was very clear that at that point there was something missing in the medical system today. We very rarely know how to treat disease but how do we treat the person? And as each and every one of us is a person, and each and every one of us is a loved one, 
dealing with the trauma that we deal with today? What are the tools that we all need? What are the tools that can take us through from moment to moment the crisis that we're about to face? Urban Zen was established on those principles. What we wanted to do was to connect the dots, to create, collaborate, and communicate the change of mind, body, and, sp of mind, body, and spirit that is the missing link in education and in healthcare, while preserving the wisdom of the cultures of the East and Western principles, particularly that of meditation and of yoga. We truly believe here that those are the tools that are so desperately needed in each one of our facilities today, and that is to all people all over the world in every education facility that meditation is definitely the key to opening our hearts, minds, and bodies, and spirits, and being able to develop the type of people that we're looking to have around us today. So a telephone call from a young woman that I knew by the name of Lynn Clark. And she asked me, Jerry, do you know how to dress a uniform? What do you mean, Lynn? Well, you know, put medals and ribbons in the proper place. I said, why? And she said, Dory committed suicide. I knew Dory. He was a Bosnia veteran, been in the military for eight years, and came home and killed himself. When I dressed the uniform and she left, I freaked out with myself. I was terribly disturbed. I knew what combat was like. I knew what it did to families. I knew what Bob Roth was doing, a good friend of mine with the David Lynch Foundation. So I called Bob and I asked him, do you think David would like to open up a division of the David Lynch Foundation called Operation Warrior Wellness? And that's the way this began. It's why you and I are here tonight. Today, there are 50, 500,000, 600,000 young veterans coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan suffering from what I suffered, undiagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder. Linda Bilmes, a professor at Harvard, and Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel laureate, wrote a book that was published in 2008 called The Three Trillion Dollar War. They estimate that it cost $15 billion a year to take care of the mental health of the veterans coming back from those two wars. Antidepressants don't work. Antipsychotic drugs don't work. We have a better solution called Transcendental Meditation. And we ask you to think about what that does for our veterans and their families. Every one of those 550,000 who are suffering from post-traumatic stress have 10 other people that are affected. Their families are affected. Everybody is affected. And we ask for your help. We ask, as an American, for your help. We ask you to help your veterans and their families. And Operation Warrior Wellness is certainly available to help, too. I had a mission. My mission was to kill Japanese. I flew 19 eight-hour long-range missions over Japan. The first was on April 7, 1945, the first land-based mission ever flown by Army Air Corps fighter planes over Japan. I watched as bombers dropped their bombs, B-29s dropped their bombs on square miles of Tokyo, which was burning, and not once did I ever think there were people on the ground. There were Japs. They were not human. They were my enemy. On August 14th, the war ended. I had flown with 16 young guys who didn't come back from the war. The oldest was 26, and the youngest was a guy from Brooklyn by the name of Phil Schlomberg, 19 years old. When I came home, I had a very difficult time. Speaking to my parents was impossible. Speaking to my sister, Maxine, was difficult. It was tough to talk with anybody. I had no buddies. I had no airplane. I had no mission to fly. I really had little purpose in my life. 
In 1949, on Good Friday, I went on a blind date with a young lady from Brooklyn, Helene Shulman. We were engaged on May 30th, married on October 22nd, 1949. Our first son was born on November 6th, 1950. Our fourth son was born August 16th, 1960. And without Helene, without her support, without her knowing anything about what I did or why I behaved as I did. She loved me and I loved her. And then, in 1975, she saw Maharishi Mahesh Yogi on television and decided she wanted to learn how to do transcendental meditation. And she learned, and I learned shortly after, and my life changed dramatically. I felt comfortable with myself. I felt better about myself. I felt better about other people. I became a better person. Last year, early in the year, I received a 